Entrepreneur on Fire, episode 73. Welcome to EntrepreneurOnFire.com, where remarkable entrepreneurs share their inspiring story. Let their journey illuminate your path to success. And now, your host, John Dumas. All right, Fire Nation, we're going to start off today's episode with a big thank you to Ralph Keen Tarot. Do you want to have a great business? There's only one magazine to help you make that happen. Check out The Great Business Project magazine, the only magazine for real entrepreneurs by real entrepreneurs. Get it on your iPad today. Visit thegreatbusinessproject.com to get your copy. Okay, let's get started. I am simply thrilled to introduce my guest today. Patrick Roach. Patrick, are you prepared to ignite? Oh, indeed I am, John. Thanks. Wonderful. Patrick is the founder of Think Tank, Portland, Maine's telecommuting hub. Think Tank is part of a new wave of shared office space that is cropping up in cities all over the world. Think Tank offers a variety of private offices, dedicated desks, conference rooms, and shared workstations. In addition to founding Think Tank, Patrick also sits on the board of Mensk, a stellar nonprofit arts council that generates public arts programming for the city of Portland. Patrick, I've given Fire Nation a little overview. I know you do a lot more than what I just described, so why don't you take it from here and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Right. Thanks, John. Um, I think you encapsulated it pretty well. Um, You know, uh, currently, I moved to Maine about two years ago and uh, founded Think Tank. We have two locations now, one on Exchange Street, one on Congress Street. Um, and it's growing very fast, it's becoming a you know, pretty vibrant network of professional um, creative tech sector people. Um, people are sharing their work, they're collaborating, and, and we're hosting a lot of events and networking events. And really, I'm trying at this juncture to um, really coalesce a lot of the creative talent here in Portland and give them a place to kind of think of as, their, um, as a hub for their social networking and for their professional networking. Um, yeah, uh, beyond, beyond that, uh, I've got a lot of projects going on. I've got a very uh, diverse background um, in, in the building trades as a contractor. I've worked in film production for about six years in New York City and in San Francisco. And um, I've kind of, you know, essentially over the years, um, been steadily acquiring a lot of skill sets. And um, I apply them day to day with this new space. Um, I think it takes kind of a diversified uh, individual to kind of run a space like this um, in that there's a lot, of, a lot to do and a lot of ideas to share. That's very cool. Thanks for sharing that with us. Because myself, I'm originally born and raised in Maine, but after I graduated from high school, I took off for 13 years. I was in the Army for a bunch of that time and lived in a couple of different cities like Boston and New York City, which are very cutting edge technological cities. And I really enjoyed living in that environment. And when I finally came back to Maine myself just last year, one thing I was a little worried about was, were we going to have the kind of cutting edge stuff that I was used to? And it was so nice to see stuff like what you've created with Think Tank and a couple other things that are going on right now in the Portland, Maine area that really are taking us into being relevant in the virtual space and in the telecommuting space. So I really am glad that there's people like you out there doing what you do, Patrick. Yeah, thanks, John. Seriously. And uh, just a quick follow up on that, that point. You know, um, I, came, I chose Portland very deliberately. It's kind of like my adopted city uh, because this place is growing very quickly. Um, people are recognizing it as an excellent place to work uh, and live. And we're, you know, I think the co-working paradigm that I've kind of established here is part of, um, you know, uh, solidifying its Portland as a place where you can actually have a viable career. So it's a great place to live, but to work is a little bit of a challenge. So I hope that in the future people can telecommute from here and forego living in New York City or Boston or these uh, ever more so untenable cities uh, where Portland, I think, can pick up the slack and become a great place to, to, to be. I truly believe that, and I think that Maine is finally living up to our motto, the way life should be. Right. Yeah, yeah. We've got some work yet to do, but we're getting there. All right. So listen, Patrick, we're going to transition now into our next topic, which is a success quote, because at Entrepreneur on Fire, we always start every show off with a success quote. It's kind of our way of getting the motivational ball rolling for the listeners here and getting them pumped up for the great content that you have yet to share. So what do you have for us today? Uh, a success quote that I, I kind of identify with um, is, I don't know the key to success, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody. And that's a Bill Cosby quote. Um, and 
I, I, I part believe that, and I also in part don't. Um, I'm constantly trying to please everyone. But I'm learning very quickly that it's, um, it's not a viable way forward. Um, one has to be true to themselves. Um, so it, it's something I grapple with, and I'm, I, I learn from regularly. Bill Cosby just has some great quotes, and I truly do love the one you just shared. It's always just hard for me to take his quotes that seriously because he always just plays such a non-serious character on TV, but I guess you just need to take yourself out of that role that he played and just realize that he's a very smart and successful man. There's obviously a reason for it, so that's a great quote. Right, absolutely. And, you know, being, you know, even if he's a charismatic comedian, um, there's a lot of professionalism and a lot of work that goes into that. And his, the way he's conducted himself all along, this goes for a lot of celebrity. Uh, they don't really get the credit they often deserve as, um, as professionals. So true. So, Patrick, you did mention that you were always trying to please everybody, but you are realizing that that's just not a tenable way to go about business. So at Entrepreneur on Fire, we like to kind of drill down to the story because this is about your journey. So give us a specific example of how this quote maybe has played a role in your life or maybe where you are starting to realize that you are just not able to say yes to everybody. Right. Uh, yeah, learning to say no is, is a valuable um, you know, ad, uh, character trait. Um, yeah, I, uh, since I'm moving to Portland, this, this town is, is really excitable and, um, and energetic, and there's a lot of people who are actively working to network it. And I feel like I was just thrown you know, right into the lion's den here um, with all sorts of projects and taking on a lot of responsibilities and almost spreading myself too thin. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's important to, to recognize, one, the, the skill sets that really um, set you apart from other, other people and to focus on those, but also to, to not try and please everyone and say, I, I don't have the bandwidth for this project right now at this time. I'd love to help you out, but I have other things that are more important because you don't want to, um, again, um, spread yourself too thin and, and not do any one thing very well. Um, as a dilettante my whole life, pretty much someone who's jumped from project to project, um, one could also say I'm maybe more of a uh, a renaissance man or well-rounded, but um, I, I'm learning that I need to start focusing on you know specific projects and see them through all the way, uh, as opposed to obviously bouncing from idea to idea. That's that's not uh, no one's looking for that in this world. Absolutely, and one thing that I've always kind of relied upon and has worked very well is when people come to me with these projects or these commitments that I just don't have the time for. I'm very honest with them. I say, listen, this is a great project and you need somebody who can commit time, effort, and passion to it. And I would be shortchanging you because I don't have that time to commit to this project that you want. So I can recommend some great people who would be a great fit for this project, but that person is just not me. Right. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good lesson. I mean, I, I feel like I, I should be saying that more often, but I'm just getting there now. Awesome. So we're going to transition now to our next topic because again, we're talking about your entrepreneurial journey. And although you're not an old grizzled veteran, you still are a person who has been in the trenches and you have been there and done that and you've had your failures. You've had challenges, you've come across obstacles, and we want to hear about one in your past during your journey that was a big failure or a big obstacle that you came across and how you dealt with that. Well, um, I feel like w one of the biggest obstacles I faced, I think, was probably in television production, uh, which was, I think, you know, pairing, um, at the time I was, I was a bit younger, I was living in New York City, I was very eager to get involved in TV and film production, uh, it seemed very kind of glorious and, um, I don't know, just exciting, and I, I got paired up with this particular reality TV show that was like a pilot for HBO that I never even made it to HBO because it was too scandalous. Um, but I remember, you know, having a real kind of moral quandary of deciding really like what purpose I wanted to have, uh, you know, in the world moving forward professionally and not to let, you know, my ambitions um, cloud my, uh, my morals, essentially. And so I was on this production that, uh, that had great, um, I don't know, potential and had uh, you know, a great potential for me professionally, but I actually had to bow out of it about six months into it because I didn't agree with what was happening on set and um, you know, thereby cutting a t uh, severing a tie that might have you know, given me a leg up professionally, but again, was uh, antithetical to my own you know, um, ethical standards. And so I think you know, uh, the lesson I, I drew from that at a much earlier age was just that 
um, moral you know, you know, or ethical um, standards are really important. You should know your, your way forward and have a, a very acute vision of what it is you're trying to bring into the world and, and not veer from that. Like if, if you believe something, not to compromise um, your beliefs uh, in order to make a short, you know, uh, a short term, uh, I guess, uh, I'm not sure the word I'm looking for here, but to, to make some kind of gain, a short term gain. Thank you for being so specific about exactly what the situation was and what it could have potentially cost you professionally. And let's really drill down now to right after you decided to walk away from this opportunity, what happened? Uh, a great sense of relief. I felt, I felt much better about my, my standing in the world and not being party to something that I thought was, um, was deviant and uh, sadistic, um, such as so much reality TV actually is. Um, yeah, I felt like it gave me a sense, a greater sense of self worth, and knowing that um, that I had I had grounding and foundation that was valid and um, and more important than some uh, notion of success. Was there a specific opportunity that cropped up soon after that that you were able to take advantage of that you may not have been able to if you were still delved into that prior situation? Uh, it could be. Um, I know some of the cast and crew all got arrested on set uh, on Hollywood Boulevard, and I managed to a- avoid that catastrophe. Um, if, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, uh, yeah, I, who knows what direction that path would have taken me? Um, you know, I, um, you know, I, I was, again, I was young, and I think um, you have to kind of throw yourself into to it, into the mix and get uh, an idea of you know where where you're situated in that mix. Um, and uh, you know, at this point, it's like the butterfly effect. There's no way of going back or right, you know, trying to trace back your path and determine how you arrived at where you are today. But uh, I'm happy with where I am, despite all the trials and tribulations. You know. And what was the next specific opportunity that you jumped on after walking away from that? Um, well, I, I ended up taking again, like you know, being interested in a lot of diversified fields and such. I ended up uh, kind of moving out of um, of working on film sets as a PA. And started branching out and doing my own video editing. I took a lot of, took on a lot of freelance work as video editor, um, and then eventually became an associate producer for a production company called Principal Pictures, and we did work for Lifetime TV. Uh, so it opened up doors there, um, and um, it allowed me, you know, again to move forward um, without, you know, some some guilt riding on my shoulders. And I was able to choose more effectively the projects I wanted to be a part of. Great lesson. And we're going to use that to transition to our next topic, which is an aha moment. Entrepreneur on Fire, again, we're really focused on your journey as an entrepreneur. And every entrepreneur has small aha moments throughout every day, week, or month that really propels them to the next level and inspires them to just continue to create and to move forward in the direction that they've set for themselves. But every now and then, we do have that one big light bulb that just comes on and we just see the clouds part, the sun shines through. Have you had an aha moment like that, Patrick? Um, yeah, John, I think, I think I can say that I have. I think, um, you know, for me, again, this is kind of becoming a theme, but this idea of kind of the well-roundedness factor, just having a lot of different interests in the world and having worked in different fields. Um, one of the things that's, that's led me all these different directions over the years was just interest in different people and all of their ideas and sharing ideas and developing ideas with people um, collaboratively. And one of the aha moments I've had was um, was realizing that my instinct to build up a space and a community of people to work together, uh, so as to more effectively generate new ideas and bat them around, um, that was kind of my way of like satisfying my own desire, which was to surround myself with brilliant people and um, helping them to helping both them and myself to achieve greater things in doing so. Mm-hmm. And so the aha moment is just realizing that I could have it both ways. I could say I could create a business that actually satisfies my social desire to surround myself with brilliant people, but also to um, foster a community that enhances the intellectual um, uh, promise of that, that group. Um, so it, it's kind of, it was like for me, like I stumbled upon this idea of co-working. I didn't, I didn't look into it in market research. It was kind of more of like an instinctual kind of organic process creating this, this space. Um, so I think that might, might suffice as an answer. So when you did have this aha moment, what were some actual specific actions that you took to turn that into a reality? 
Um, I, well, it, it started out with a lot of talk, I think. A lot of networking, a lot of pounding the pavement, um, developing this idea of like, you know, finding out whether or not people were interested in having a, a shared office space where a, autonomous freelancing people could all kind of work uh, separate but together. And, um, and so what I was trying to do was talk it up and talk about synergy and talk about collaboration and talk about all the brilliant opportunities that would kind of arise out of this. Um, kind of community, and for a long time it was it was kind of just um, I guess wishful thinking, kind of fake it till you make it, kind of believing in something that wasn't tangible yet. But I knew instinctually that if I did build this thing and do it properly, stylistically, aesthetically, uh, culturally, that it would come to pass, and it it has. So the first step was was kind of selling an idea, selling someone an, on an idea that didn't exist yet. Um, and so that was that was a bit of a challenge, and took it took a, a lot of belief in um, in the idea. So when you first had that idea, there was not a existing think tank type shared office space telecommuting anywhere in the United States? No, there were, but I, I wasn't really that aware of them. There were some similar you know, platforms in New York. There's one called Paragraph I belonged to in New York a long time ago, but it was for writers. It was like a writing, um, it was like a space just to write. Um, and, uh, and I'd heard of Hub, but I hadn't really looked into it yet. And really, it was it was it kind of evolved. Uh, you know, the idea kind of evolved here in Portland, uh, and then simultaneously, um, there's you know this idea of like you know hive mind or whatever. Uh, but basically, two weeks after I opened my original space, a second loca- a second place opened up. My competitor uh, down the street um, with a lot more money and a lot more um, in- infusion of capital up front. Uh, but to this day, I think think tank still remains the the vibrant um, kind of hub for Portland. It's got a very you know active scene here. Um, so I, I shouldn't say that I, it's not like I invented co-working by any means, but I kind of did it my own way and kind of stumbled upon it accidentally, which is, I think, is what's been happening throughout the country and throughout the world. People are realizing this is a new new work paradigm that, that suits people very, very well socially. Uh, and it's bringing people together that were, would otherwise have been separate and disparate working on the internet and telecommuting. Now people have a real tangible place to be and a real tangible community again. I could not agree more. Patrick, have you had an I've made it moment? Um, not yet. We're getting there. Um, I feel like um, you know, the city is, you know, is welcoming me welcome with open arms. And um, my role here is continuing to evolve. And, um, and I have to continue to, to challenge myself and step up to the plate and, and fulfill duties uh, and social obligations that uh, you know, I'm not always prepared for. Uh, but the city is recognizing, I think, what I'm bringing to bear. Um, and the value of what this space is, uh, both culturally and professionally. Um, and uh, so I think, I think it's, it's around the corner. I think I, I have not quite arrived. And even when, once I have arrived, I think, um, I will continue to pursue other endeavors and challenge myself and other people's perceptions of myself um, so as to, you know, keep the ball rolling. Uh, I'm not about stasis. This is about the journey, so there is no actual destination. Although it is important, and I do definitely stress, when you do get to a certain goal that you've reached, it's time to sit back, smell the roses, and appreciate what you have accomplished, and then drive forward. So I definitely applaud you for that mentality and wish you the best of luck in that venture. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, it's, it's, been, a great, it's been a great trip, and uh, it feels good to be settling in, having a reached critical mass, and uh, seeing the community kind of flourish. Uh, around some of the ideas that, that I created. It's it really, it, it's nice. So Patrick, we're going to move to the next topic now, and this is your current business. A lot of the listeners here at Entrepreneur on Fire are entrepreneurs in the making. They're thinking about just breaking away and making that launch into their passion or into their idea or into their potential light bulb moment. Or maybe they already have, and they're still just really enjoying and grasping everything around them that's soaking it all in, so to speak. Paint us a picture of exactly what your vision was for Think Tank and then what the reality of it actually is right now for entrepreneurs. Mm, okay. Yeah. I mean, speaking to, you know, future entrepreneurs or, you know, budding um, business people, I guess, um, you know, I, I, saw, I saw a way um, to, to connect, you know, um, again, on a tangible level, people um, that I, I was finding, you know, like technology has driven apart, um, and so it, it was. It was kind of a matter of like the the um, necessity being the mother of all invention. 
um, I just saw a, a, an opening. I think, I think every invention idea, every product, every new business model, you need to have an angle. You know, what's, what, is, what are you going to bring to the table that's, that's unique and interesting? What's your spin on you know, existing um, uh, phenomena or business models? And I think with what I'm going for personally is trying to uh, re like reconnect, uh, like weave together the social fabric that has been kind of dissolved over the years of um, with the computer age. Uh, people are often now obviously like Skyping and um, video conferencing and emailing, but they're not actually convening socially as, as real human beings. And I think uh, part of my purpose is to try and bring some of that humanity back into the workplace and find ways that we can um, benefit from that. So um, I think moving forward in this society, I think that message alone, actually, it, however inarticulate that might have been, is is really valid. I think in the next, you know, let's say half a century, I think we're going to see more emphasis and not less on um, tangible um, networks. I think people want to see, um, like, want to uh, be in, in real time with real people. And um, I think we need to gravitate towards back towards that if we want to see our societies and our businesses succeed. I'm going to tell a quick story just because I do feel like it relates to that and really just kind of shows that you are passionate about what you're doing as far as connecting people face to face in this, what can be oftentimes too virtual a world. Because for me, yes, I'm based here in Maine, but you are one of the very few people from Maine who I have interviewed. So it's just kind of random that we are located quite close to each other and you were having a little difficulty with Skype this morning and you finally just sent me an email and said, why don't we just talk on the phone like normal people? And I had to come back and just say, well, unfortunately, it's really the phone quality is the reason. I mean, Skype to Skype has extremely high quality, whereas phone to phone would be pretty poor when it translates to an MP3. But the reason why I'm saying this is because it really does show that you really are a person that's looking to bring people together physically, which is so important for the creation of ideas and just that whole kind of perception is reality where you're together and your ideas are just molding together and you're working as one. So I do applaud what you're doing and I'm definitely looking forward to delving more into that in Portland and other cities that I visit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, John. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's a privilege to have you, know, have you here in Portland. Um, it's a great coincidence really uh, as far as I'm concerned. And um, well, actually, it's no coincidence. It's a great city and really great people are, are, uh, are gravitating here. I definitely agree with that. So, Patrick, what is one thing that's really exciting you about Think Tank today? Just it, it's, it's scalability. I, I feel like it's going to become a model for you know other cities, other places that are, are needing a um, you know redevelopment. I feel like there's there's opportunity galore. Um, the the network that is that is kind of like been kind of forged uh, through this space and my own personal network, it, the sky is the limit. You know, I'm, I'm working every day with brilliant people who have exceptional ideas and all of whom really care about a sense of place, uh, care about the state of Maine, care about Portland, but also just big ideas like this idea that like, um, you know, if we're going to advance culture further and not destroy ourselves, that we need to kind of um, reevaluate how we work together. And I think this, this model, albeit, you know, somewhat young, it's still a kind of new, new concept, even globally. Um, has got a lot of potential, and I think you know, the world can learn a lot from, um, com like not communal, but you know, co-working spaces in general. So I, I feel like I've tapped into a very important um, growing zeitgeist, and um, it, it feels good to be a part of that, basically. Wonderful. Now, one thing I will have to comment on is that your vocabulary is quite incredible. My transcriptionist, I'm sure, is going to have to have a dictionary next to her while she's uh, typing away here, but... That was just a little side note. Uh, that's good. Well, I think people need to work on their vocabularies in general. I think their words are important. You know, I think um, the more specific you can be, the better. Well, you definitely succeed in that venture. So you have touched on it in the last answer, but I really do want to know, give me something specific as far as a vision that you have for the future of Think Tank. Um, well, I, I'd like to see this model scaled out. I think that there's other cities uh, around the state and throughout the country that are, you know, let's say they've fallen on hard times, they're old mill towns that have a great infrastructure downtown, but the people have kind of fled. Um, if we want to bring, reinvigorate those cities, I think that, um, you know, like Think Tank as a business model, um, you know, can be scaled out and uh, franchised essentially and uh, supported by a, a municipality uh, in order to um, attract 
the, the, the talent that might surround the city but have no one place to convene. Uh, it's kind of like you know, a modern day you know, co coffee shop type environment, but where people actually get real work done and actually really do collaborate and not just look around at like, all the people coming through the door. Because that's exactly what happens right now is when you walk into a coffee shop, there's nobody collaborating. They almost feel like they can't collaborate because they're going to be bugging other people. So that's why it's so important to have an environment that promotes that kind of activity. Absolutely. Yeah. Through, through networking events and through like, um, just symposiums and workshops. And, you know, we're definitely, you know, driving that side of things. And that's kind of like the, the second or third phase of this, this space. Um, but you know, again, this, this thing can be adapted and repurposed for any given community. Uh, it would take some doing, you have to look at the real estate and a lot of other factors and demographics, but a lot of other cities similar to Portland who are just now, uh, burgeoning or growing, uh, their, their creative economy, um, could do well to um, kind of uh, in, uh, undertake this kind of project uh, because this is going to be good for Portland. It's going to be good for be good for Providence, Rhode Island. It'd be good for Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Burlington, Vermont. Um, the big cities they take care of themselves. They've got abundance of these places. Uh, but I think the smaller second tier cities. I think that's like a really interesting marketplace for this sort of idea. Well, being a Providence College Friar alum, I'm glad you brought up one of my favorite cities. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great, great town. I dig it. Good old round. So, Patrick, we've now reached my favorite part of the show. We're about to enter the lightning round, and this is where I provide you with a series of questions, and you come back at us, Fire Nation, with amazing and mind-blowing answers. Now, we're going to have to limit these to about 10 seconds or less answers, so you can be very succinct and direct with them. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah, let's do it. What was the number one thing holding you back from becoming an entrepreneur? Money, personal capital. What is the best business advice you ever received? It's not business advice, but I like it. Um, it is find what you love and let it kill you. That's what Bukowski said. Wow, that could have been your quote, too. It could have been. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little dark, but it's true. You, got, you have to be that passionate, I think. I love it. What's something that's working for you or your business right now? Uh, my, my social capital, I think it's essential here in a city like Portland, but it's essential everywhere. What is the best business book that you've read in the last six months? Um, I haven't really read a, a business book in the past six months, but um, there's, uh, well, there's a few out there. This is not, it's already past 10 seconds. Do you just read the dictionary? Is that all you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that and The New Yorker. All right. Well, that's great. The New Yorker, we're going to use that one. I love yeah. it. It's the first magazine on the show. So uh, that's awesome. This last question, Patrick's my favorite, but it's kind of a tricky one. So take your time, digest it, and then come back at us with an answer. If you woke up tomorrow morning with all the experience, knowledge, and money that you currently have today, but your business had completely disappeared, forcing you to start with a clean slate, which many of our listeners are facing right now, you couldn't do the exact same thing that you're doing right now, but what would you do? Mm, yeah, I, would, I, I think I would um, envision my next project in full. I would like flesh it out to its highest potential, con completely conceptualizing it. Um, and then I would basically draft a simple business plan maybe um, until I could get my pitch kind of straight, my elevator speech. Uh, and then I would go out. I'd pound the pavement. I'd, I'd hit every networking event I could. I would uh, make very clear my intentions with the project, make clear my honesty and sincerity and my drive. And I would get people to believe in the, in the idea and get people to believe in me as an entrepreneur um, because I think there's a ton of serendipity and a ton of synergy out there waiting to happen. And I think people won't want to connect with that. They want to believe and they want to, um, want to believe in entrepreneurs. Uh, so it's a matter of just being confident, but having your ducks in a row. I love it. And I love your offline take of this because too many people these days are just solely focused in the online world. And it's really a combination of the two that's going to equal success. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing all the device today in the show, because we as Fire Nation are definitely better for it. Yeah. Give Fire Nation one last piece of guidance, then give yourself a quick plug, and then we'll say goodbye. Um, hello, Fire Nation. Um, progress is, is critical. Uh, do right by, by your community, by your friends, by your loved ones, and do right by yourself, and um, uh, recognize that we're all in this together. Uh, and then I am Pat Roach. I am the founder and director of Think Tank, which is a co-working space in Portland. 
and it is uh, a very cool thing to be a part of. If you're a professional in the main area or you're passing through Portland, look us up. Uh, I think tankportland.com and uh, you will be pleasantly surprised by this awesome community of professionals. Awesome, Patrick. I will link all this up in the show notes. This transcription will be live on the show notes as well. So thank you once again. Fire Nation salutes you, and we'll catch you on the flip side. John, thanks a lot. This is a great, great project you have going here. Fire Nation, do you have a product or service that you would like to share with the 100,000 plus unique downloads a month Entrepreneur on Fire generates? Chris Brogan did, and when he sponsored an episode, he saw great results. If you'd like to have 15 seconds at the top of one of our shows to share your product or message, go to www.sponsoreofire.com to find out more. Thank you for joining us at entrepreneuronfire.com, your daily dose of inspiration. Prepare to ignite.